A very good morning to all of you. Welcome to the first episode of Free Knowledge Academy Weekly Sunday Webinar Series, the first lecture of the year for the year 2024. I thank you all for joining up in, uh, with us today. Before moving on to the lecture, let's go to see some housekeeping rules. The webinar link will be open for you to join in from 9 to 9.45 a.m. No late attendees will be permitted to join thereafter. Kindly keep your mics and videos turned off during the lecture. If you have any questions, you can type it in the chat box or you can ask directly from the lecturer at the end of the lecture. You have to stay until the end of the lecture to obtain the e-certificate and the CPD points. Moving on to today's lecture, the topic is preserving the miracle of the antibacterials. Today, the guest lecturer is Professor Shalini Sri Ranganath. Let me introduce her to you. She is a professor in pharmacology and specialist in pediatrics as well. She obtained an MBBS degree from the Faculty of Medicine, University of Jaffna, an MD Pediatrics, and the Diploma of Child Health from University of Colombo. She was awarded Commonwealth Scholarship for further training in pediatric clinical pharmacology in UK. She obtained a PhD for the thesis title Pharmacovigilance and Toxicovigilance in Pediatrics from the University of Wales College of Medicine, Cardiff, UK in 2004. She also obtained MRCP London and Diploma in Medical Toxicology during her training period in UK. Her awards include 10 prestigious medals and awards during her undergraduate training and Prof. Priyani Soisa Gold Medal for the Best Performance in MD Pediatrics and Presidential, Presidential Award for the Scientific Publication for the years 2013, 14, 15, and 17. Her research interests are mainly in the area of medicine for children, safety of medicines and vaccination, pharmacovigilance, essential medicine, drug utilization, antibacterial consumption, pragmatic clinical trials in children, and, pharma, uh, and paracetamol overdose. At present, she serves in many national and international organization, organizations. She is a member of the World Health Organization Expert Advisory Panel on Drug Evaluation since 2009 and a member of Pediatric Subcommittee of International Union of Basic and Clinical Pharmacology since 2010. She is a member of the editorial board of the Ceylon Medical Journal since 2005 and currently serves as a section editor. She also serves in the editorial boards of Postgraduate Institute of Medicine Journal, Ceylon, College, uh, Ceylon Journal of Medical Sciences and Sri Lanka Journal of Surgery. She has authorized about 45 publications and 80 scientific communications. So it is my privilege uh, to welcome today's guest lecturer, Professor Shalini Sri Ranganathan, who was also one of my lecturers during my undergraduate days. Dear Madam, over to you to conduct your timely lecture. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. So first of all, let me thank for inviting me to do this presentation uh, by the Society for Healthcare Research and Innovation. And I saw a new name called Sri Knowledge Academy. Uh, and also I thank the participants who are sort of willing to attend the CPD program on a Sunday morning. And I thank the long CV presented by Dr. Melinda but um, probably in my opinion, my CV should be presented uh, by you all at the end of the presentation. If I have done a good presentation, my CV stands good. And if my presentation is a very poor presentation, that my CV stands bad. So um, that's my objective of doing any presentation. So let us move on to the uh, real presentation or talk of this today. Uh, first of all, I thank all of you. I know the people are very happy to have this presentation, but as you can see, the bacteria is going to be very, very unhappy because after listening to this presentation, some of you would take some actions where the bacteria may not be able to become resistant to antibacterials that we are prescribing. So therefore, the bacteria starts to cry. If you are really interested in listening to this presentation, take the message in your practice. And the next slide, as you can see, that um, why I actually accepted this invitation, because Sunday mornings are not for academic purposes, because we always do academic from Monday to Saturday. Because of that, the reason I have put it here, as you can see, that we teach in undergraduate faculties as a pharmacologist. And as soon as the doctors graduate and leave our faculty, they are left all alone in your practice, right? We are without the contact with most of the academics that we have taught you, especially the preclinical and paraclinical academics. So my reason for actually accepting these type of CPD programs is actually to come out and meet the doctors who are struggling every day to make use of the medicines available in Sri Lanka. 
uh, which we have been teaching them for a long time before they actually graduated. So that is the reason that I wanted to create a bridge between the university department and the clinical practice. And that is the reason that I accepted this uh, presentation. Now, if you go back to the title of this presentation is it is actually preserving the miracle of antibacterial. So why this topic has become very, very important these days, it can be shown in these two slides. As you can see on left side, you can see antibacterial resistance is rising exponentially. Right. So there is no word for that to express the problem that we are having in our hand. And on the other side, if you can see, I will explain that later also that we have a void. That means the manufacturers, the pharmaceutical industry are not manufacturing many antibacterials and the pipeline is becoming very dry. So as you can see, by 2020, we didn't have many antibacterials, but between 1920s and 1950s, where the resistance was not of a huge problem, there were so many antibacterials being manufactured. So therefore, if we want to have these antibacterials and if we want our infections to be treated, on one side, we had to contain the antibacterial resistance, and on the other side, we had to preserve the miracle of remaining precious antibacterials because new antibacterials are hardly coming. And even if they come, they are quite expensive. And sometimes the lower or middle income countries may not be able to afford to procure them. So the only option or two options that we have in our countries is one is trying as much as possible to contain or combat the antimicrobial resistance. And the second one is trying to preserve the miracle of remaining precious antibacterials. So this talk is all about the second point that I have made. As you can see in this picture that the bacteria are actually clean bowling all of us, that the antibiotics are falling down and we are losing wickets of antibacterial very quickly. And at one point we might end up with probably a very low score, probably all wickets have gone, unless we take some actions to preserve our existing antibacterials and to ensure its miracle. And as you can see in the next slide, because it is an online presentation, I thought some form of figures will give you more information than a lot of uh, uh, information on the slide. So as you can see, the uh, bacteria are hitting the antibacterial medicines very badly, either hitting or boxing or uh, forcing the wickets. And, and the bottom slide, as you can see, the previous one I put earlier also, as you can see, there had been a pre-antibiotic era before the penicillin was, before penicillin also, there had been some antibacterial agents, but penicillin was considered as the breakthrough in antibacterial medicines. So as you can see, you had a pre-antibiotic era, then the golden age of antibiotics. So that means several antibiotics were coming with new mode of action. Everyone is having a different type of mode of action, novel mechanisms. Then subsequently, what you can look at is between somewhere 1970 to 2000, most of the antibacterials were coming actually have not been having novel mode of action. They are me too antibiotics. So if the mode of action of penicillin and cephalosporin is acting on cell wall, subsequent antibiotics also like a preaxone act on cell wall, and some of them act on 50S ribosome. So the bacteria is very familiar, so they are not bothered about this Me Too antibiotics. They become quickly resistant, and probably we are ending up, fortunately not up to now, maybe a situation called post-antibiotic era. But at that time when penicillin was introduced in 1940s itself, even the Alexander Fleming, one of the scientists involved in the development of penicillin has predicted this antibacterial resistance is going to be a bit of a problem. And within about two to three years of penicillin being uh, introduced into the market, there had been resistance to penicillin also. The miracle of antibacterial agents is not only for patients. As you can see, the pharmaceutical industry, though they are very reluctant to manufacture antibiotics, as you can see how their market has been growing and how it is projected to grow in 2030, 2031 and 2032 with um, antibacterial manufacturing. But still, the pharmaceutical industries are running away uh, from making antibacterial agents because they can make more profit with other medicines like, as you know, the non-communicable diseases, mental health diseases, cosmetic purposes. So if they develop medicines for that, it lasts in the market for a long time and they can price it very high. The high income countries would procure that and there is no problem of resistance. So they are losing interest in manufacturing antibacterial agents. And if you, this is a 
about 2020 data, what they have found is that by about 2020, in the last three years or so, there have been only about seven or eight new antibacterials. And within that also, only one or two had novel mode of mechanisms. So what I'm trying to stress to you is you are not going to get many new antibacterial. As you go on practicing, we may have to save um, and preserve the miracle of antibacterials that we have with us now. So that is the justification of the title and the aim of my presentation. So, but that doesn't mean we don't need to work to develop new antibacterials. So as I have shown here, the challenge to the science, that is a pharmaceutical science, as well as the people with money, is to develop new antibacterial agents with novel mechanisms. Because if the mechanism is not novel, and if it is like a mechanism of cephalosporins or beta-lactam, the bacteria will develop resistant very soon. But if you have a novel mode of action, it will take any way the bacteria will develop resistance, but it will take some time for the bacteria to develop resistance. So that is the challenge to the science and the people with money. But the challenge to the healthcare system, that is you and me, is actually preserving the effectiveness, or that is called miracle, of existing antibacteria. So we should challenge the bacteria preventing it from becoming resistant to the existing antibacterials and had to delay this development of resistance as much as possible, ensuring that the miracle is intact. So that is the important reason that I accepted and actually I am the one who suggested this particular topic as well, because that uh, my intention is to convert few of you so that you will take this challenge and do something. So the next question is, how can we preserve the effectiveness of miracle of antibacterials? So if you go to the very top level, that means at the level of WHO, they have suggested, um, I think, about four to five strategies to combat antimicrobial resistance. And the fourth one is optimize the use of antimicrobial medicine with humans. These are all taken from online resources, all of them would be available for you as well. So of the activities that they have listed to optimize the use of antimicrobial, because I am speaking mainly about antibacterial, the per one, two, three, four, fifth one is actually for mainly for the healthcare team, because the first one is mainly for the regulatory authorities and the supply division. Second one is also probably for regulatory authority. Third one is also for regulatory authority. Fourth one is supply division. Fifth one is mainly for the healthcare team, which is working in a hospital. Sixth one is for all of us, that is to not to get um, addicted or not to get used to accept incentive from pharmaceutical industry and promoting or using antibacterials irrationally. So the sixth point is for all of us because at the end of it, even the even the proprietor or the executive of the pharmaceutical industry would need this antibiotic. So I hope they will also not do this unethical promotion of antibacterial agents. So of these uh, eight or whatever the points, as you can see, the fifth point is mainly for the healthcare team that is called antibacterial bacterial or antimicrobial stewardship. So that means that we have a program in place in our hospitals to actually to contain antibacterial resistant as well as to preserve the miracle of the antibacteria. So what do you mean by this um, antimicrobial or antibacterial stewardship is, it's like just you select the correct antibacterial agent, you give the correct dose, you use it for appropriate duration, expecting best clinical outcome with minimal side effects as well as have a minimum impact on subsequent resistance. So that is the antimicrobial stewardship. So each hospital should have this in place and should have activities under this particular objective to ensure that your hospital is a champion in resisting antimicrobial or antibacterial resistance. But the unfortunate, we are developed countries or high-income countries who can cope 
with the problem of antibacterial resistance by way of procuring even the new antibacterial agents or by way of giving vaccines to prevent infection or by way of having a good laboratory and surveillance network are very careful with antibacterial agents and have been having this stewardship program in almost all the hospitals that people have worked in overseas and have back to Sri Lanka. You know about it that they are very careful with antibacterial agents. We are at the lower middle income countries where we cannot afford such a healthcare in our countries are so stupid and we don't have much of this antimicrobial stewardship program or don't name like that or even we don't think about the problem of antibacterial resistance which tells me that we have been very foolish right so as you can see like this man that we are actually making our fall intentionally right so if we don't take any action this man also will fall and we will also fall so the next part of this presentation is actually giving you some information in your own practice you may be a house servicer you may be a registrar you may be a SHO you may be a GP you may be a specialist wherever you are whatever the patients that you see whatever the practice you have that I have tried to tell you a few points how you can ensure the miracle of antibacterial agents. I'm not checking the chat to questions. So probably I will do that at the end of this presentation because I'm not multitask to do both together. Let me finish this presentation and look at the chats. So how the miracle can be preserved? So the first thing is that if you don't use the antibacterial, that's a first step in preserving the miracle. Let's see where we can avoid using antibacterial. Then selecting the antibacterial appropriately. So the red ones are the ones that I will explain in the subsequent uh, presentation and the black one actually I might not because I will not have time to do that. So when you look at the other three efficacy, safety and quality antibacterial, because providing this safe quality assured efficacy antibacterials is not responsibility of the healthcare team, which is working in hospitals, it is beyond the healthcare team, including regulatory as well as the supply system of the country. The next one is that um, if you can remember the lectures that I have been doing to the students for so many years, that I always say that the it is not the name of the medicine which matters in your prescription, the subsequent matters that you are supposed to write in clear handwriting, like a dose, dosage form, route of administration, uh, dose interval and uh, duration also matters a lot so we will speak about that um, a little while then about adherence and good administration practice because that is also uh, one of the neglected area in healthcare practice we never think about how a medicine we prescribe is actually given to the patient so we will discuss about that as well. And also when it comes to antibiotics, uh, we had to be very sure about the storage and disposable practice. We will look at that. And also using standard treatment guidelines, algorithm, formularies would help you to preserve the miracle. Frequent monitoring of use of antibacterials, team training, patient education, public education, audit, surveillance, research, action points, and act on them. Unfortunately, in Sri Lanka, we are some people are topping high in the research area. People are excelling in the research. A lot of people are getting award for researchers. But unfortunately, the outcome of those researchers are probably not accommodated into the patient care. So even if we do any form of research, there should be a meaning for doing that research. And the outcome of that research had to go to the patient. So this is the 16 points that I will go back and show as well, that you can select at least one of that, not to do every one of that, at least select one of this and try to implement in your own practice, you would be contributing to preserving the miracle of antibacterials. So um, let us go about the ones that I have put it in the red font. First is no antibacterials. So... What is this all about is, uh, according to this, you know, Center for Disease Control and Prevention in the United States, they are estimated about one third of antibiotic consumption in humans is actually not needed or no appropriate. All of you think carefully, all of you think that whether you present 
prescribe antibiotics or antibacterial because there is a difference, technical difference between the definition of antibiotic and antibacterial. So I like to be academic and I use the word antibacterial, but in a normal communication, both antibiotics and antibacterial means the same but the definitions are different so therefore they have their prediction is about one third of antibiotic which is used globally is not is used uh, when it is not needed or when it is not appropriate and uh, uh, Sri Lankan statistics remains unknown uh, but if you can think about it in Sri Lanka that I always say in most of my presentation Antibiotics are used as antipyretic, antiemetic, antidiarrheal, antiviral, bronchodilator, antihistamine, or rehydration salt. If a child comes and presents with uh, sneezing, an antibacterial is given. If a child comes and presents with water diarrhea, an antibacterial is given. If child comes, because I am saying child because my clinical discipline is pediatric. If a child comes with vomiting, antibiotic is given. If child comes with evidence of wheezing, an antibiotic is given. So our ratio might not be one third even. So it may be more than that. And what we see also may be a tip of the iceberg. And we really know who else are also giving antibacterials to people or the patients. Uh, even a pharmacist can give the prescription only medicine, but you know easily these antibiotics can be obtained from pharmacies without a prescription. And you know the people who have no SLMC registration are issuing antibiotics. So the problem that we see probably is the tip of the iceberg. And in Sri Lanka, I, from my experience, I think that we have been prescribing antibacterials where it is not indicated also. So based on that, I have to tell you first action. You can, there are about five action in this slide. You can pick up one action and do it for the, for the benefit of listening this presentation, not for the CPD certificate. For that, you have several rules to sort of obey, but just listening this and taking up one action would help to preserve the miracle of antibacterial. So the action one, what I want to say is never prescribe an antibacterial unless you suspect a bacterial infection. Antibacterial has only one action. That action is to either kill or stop the multiplication of antibiotic, sorry, bacteria. So if you don't suspect a bacterial infection by are giving an antibacterial agent, even if we suspect a bacterial infection, if it is not a serious one, like a meningitis or septicemia or endocarditis or pyelonephritis, if it is not a serious one, or even if it is um, suspicion is a bacterial infection, but delaying the treatment might not lead to any consequences, you still can wait for one or two days for laboratory investigation to come and for your monitoring results to come before you prescribe an antibacterial agent. Here, what happens is all of us are in a hurry. We want quick fix. Patients also want quick fix, but antibacterial agent is not a quick fix. If there is a bacteria only, it will fix the problem. If there is no bacteria, it is not going to fix the problem. And some bacterial infection that will get cured even without antibacterial agent. So please, have a good clinical judgment. So this picture, you can understand that we are now hitting back at the bacteria. We are not allowing our wickets to fall. We are going for boundaries and sixer. So that is the meaning of this uh, picture in the left side. So this is the first section. So in developed countries, I, I have been told probably about 20 years before in Australia, where they have thought about this antibacterial resistance, they go to public, right? Because they are, they are not, unlike Sri Lanka, the public ask questions. They will not take medicines without clarifying their doubts from the doctors. So they actually went to the public with a lot of messages in TV, in radio. At that time, there was no social media to actually discourage the use of antibiotic so that the public were brave and they asked the doctors do i really need an antibiotic so i was told i might have told this to some of the students in my lectures one of the slogan they they used the, in the radio in australia is common cold needs common sense not an antibiotic 
so that actually they say has actually given a lot of change in public awareness about this antibacterial resistance and whenever they get common cold even if the doctor starts to prescribe an antibiotic they say no to antibiotic so if we can't um, change our healthcare team we may have to go and change our public but in sri lanka you know that is also not possible because most of our patients are actually do not ask questions from the doctors and also they trust everything what is in the social media there can be opposite messages as well who are actually interested in promoting sales of antibiotic so that is my first point second point is a theory selection of antibacterial so if you have decided to prescribe an antibacterial now the question is which one to prescribe right there are a lot of methods there so i have not touched them so i am only bringing one which has been recently introduced by the who in 2017 and i understand our ministry of health is also keen on bringing it to sri lanka and has been taking some action during the month of november which was a week of antibacterial now it is quiet but what i want to say is that who has introduced a classification called aware classification of antibacterial agents it was actually developed in 2017 i was fortunate enough to be in the room when this was developed and when this name was uh, coined so what do you mean by aware is almost all the antibiotics uh, about 258 now are classified into access watch and reserve category and if i will come to that every 2 years based on the evidence and the antibacterial susceptibility test data the expert group in the who actually update that list so therefore you don't need to think that it is a 2017 list is in use that the latest list is 2013 which was done in april 20 so not 13 2023 april 2023 so how, what do you mean by this access and uh, watch and reserve is access group of antibacterial agents are the if you look at it are the basic antibacterial agents and every country should ensure this uh, access group antibacterial which are efficacious are uh, quality assured in available in all healthcare settings in the country so that for suspected infection where you want to prescribe an antibiotic you will start with the access group antibiotic the second one is the watch group this is of course watch so you can understand why it is watch you don't immediately start this antibiotic unless the infection is critical like our uh, meningitis septicemia pyelonephritis endocarditis right so those conditions that we don't worry about antibacterial resistance also because the benefit of antibacterial is far more higher than the development of antibacterial resistance in the future so therefore that type of infection you can even go for the watch group of antibiotics because if the access group is seems to be very um, sort of oral ones and probably not uh, highly efficacious against that particular infection i will show this slide that as well then comes the reserve group of antibiotics as you know you know in um, sri lankan we have this red red flag and diabetics where you go the approval from the consultant microbiologist to obtain so this is also some sort of that that you will keep it reserved as much as possible and try to manage an infection with access and watch and diabetic so how that is implemented is so these are all in the who web if you just put a search that you can find out all the antibiotics you know of and what is that particular group but i know what the question you have is it is not the antibiotic we need we need the antibiotic per condition so the who has produced a aware book also so that is also downloadable so in that book they have listed maybe a series of infectious syndrome so now this slide will make you to understand so three examples i have given not i have given the who has given ear infection sore throat and kidney infection this is for mainly empirical before you have bacterial isolation and the abst reports are available so when you start your first antibiotic to the patient as you can see for ear infection first line treatment the suggestion is no antibiotic therapy same for pharyngitis but not for kidney infection because we know the consequences of um, untreated 
kidney infections is severe. So therefore, the first choice, if you are going to start antibiotic therapy, first choice would be access group of antibiotic for kidney infection. It will be a watch group of antibiotic and the examples are given. So that particular book gives all of them for almost all the infectious syndrome. And you can use your expert knowledge as well as the do local data of resistance to select what appropriate access antibiotic you need for that infection and what appropriate watch group of antibiotic you need for that infection. And when you get the isolation data and the ABST, you don't need to change all the time. If the patient is responding, you can continue the same antibiotic. If the patient is not responding, then you can be guided by the antibiotic susceptibility test. So this is a very simple way of guiding selection of antibacterials. But when this was being launched from 2000 to 2015, same expert group did this research to find out how these access and watch group of antibiotics are consumed in high income countries and lower middle income countries over the 15 years before this was introduced anyway, over the 15 years, what they have found, there is a 165 percentage increase in this watch antibiotic group in lower middle income, not, oh yeah, lower middle income countries, there is 27.9 percentage increase in high income countries. Again, you would argue that the infections are very high in high lower income, low income countries. So that is what we are going for, watch antibiotics. But in your heart, you know, that's not the reason, right? Because in public sector, I will come to that, where more complicated infections are being treated, their consumption of watch group of antibiotic is very much less in Sri Lanka. I will show you the data compared to the private sector. There we probably the proportion of severe infectious diseases being treated is less than the public sector. So what I want to show is that we are careless with antibacterials more than the high income countries. Because of that, this is also one of the recent data. As you can see, bloodstream infection due to MRSA with the available data, you can see lower middle income countries is 33, high income countries is 15. We are paying the price. And the third generation cephalosporin resistant E. coli, again 58.3 percentage and 17.53 percentage. And we have the data, so it's actually one of my research together with Professor Chamdani Manigatunga and two other researchers we published in 2021. This is a 2017 data. As you can see, the watch and the reserve category. So as the target is the access should be 60%. So that is what the WHO says. But you can see in private sector, the use of watch category is um, higher than the use of uh, uh, watch category in the public sector. So in the public sector, the watch is about 20%, whereas in the private sector, it is more than about 50 or even up to 60%, 58%. So you can see where we are going wrong and how we are actually allowing uh, this use of watch category in our country, which has been contributing to development of resistance. So the message from this point is, to you today itself go and get this WHO aware book don't wait until Sri Lanka Ministry of Health publish a local version I don't know when it will happen even but please make use of the book promote that aware classification if you think it is valid because it's a user IT based there are a lot of medical informatics around there are social media is around you all have your whatsapp group for your hospitals you have your whatsapp group for your registrars so publicize this aware classification as much as possible, use the AVR classification. And this access group, I will come at the end of the presentation also, the access group antibacterials have to be available in the hospitals all the time. So demand for them from the administrators that you need to have a stock of access group antibacterial. And those who have a practice in private sector, my polite request is, please have the same practice in both public and private sector. Just because the antibacterials are widely available in the private sector, just because the patient can afford the antibacterials in the private sector, that you don't need to go for a different antibiotic in the private sector, 
because with the antibiotic you are treating the patient in the public sector so the same practice can be followed in the private sector as well now let us go on to the other one it's a bit of a difficult one i think i have about 20 minutes pharmacokinetic pharmacodynamic and dosing strategies i know the Doctors are not very happy about pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic. It is only to pass the exam during undergraduate period. But unfortunately, in order to treat an infection successfully, in order to ensure the miracle that dynamics and kinetics are very important, your selection of antibacterial should be based on the kinetic and dynamic as well. Because if you look at this picture, don't need to read it, right? No need to even memorize it. To, uh, for a successful treatment of an infection, it's not enough to have the correct antibiotic. You need to get adequate concentration of the antibiotic at the site of infection. So in order to get the adequate concentration at the site of infection, all these factors play a role. Pharmacokinetic, pharmaceutical, pharmacodynamic and prescribing factors. So therefore, you cannot neglect kinetic or dynamic. So what is kinetic? It is a mathematical description of the biological rate process by which concentrations are altered in the body. It governs how much drug reach the site of action, even if you swallow the recommended dose. So you will say, I prescribe the recommended dose, but if the pharmacokinetic is altered or if the pharmacokinetic is not perfect, then the concentration will not be adequate at the site of infection. Then what is pharmacodynamics? That is most of you know, that is actually the mode of action, how the antibacterial bring about the mode of action. So why they are important? So this is a very interesting slide, but I don't know whether you will understand through this online discussion. As a clinician, what you and me want is we are not bothered about dynamics. We are not bothered about kinetics. We give a medicine to the patient and we want to see the effect out. Right. So today morning, I give a medicine to the patient, 500 milligram. Tomorrow, I want to see the effect. So that is the clinical pharmacology. That is the clinical side of it. But when you give 8 a.m. 500 milligram of an antibiotic, in order to give the effect outside, there should be dynamic and kinetic in place because the dose is converted to concentration by kinetics. So the graph for the kinetic is time versus concentration, right? So if you can see, this is a kinetic graph here that you can, the second one. So 8 a.m. we gave the drug and 500 milligram we have given, how that 500 milligram changes into concentration is governed by the pharmacokinetic. So that will determine how much will reach the site of action. Then what happened is based on the concentration, there should be a response that is the pharmacodynamics. So the graph here, as you can see, this is the concentration and that is the effect. But what we see next day morning is the effect outside. So we give a medicine today, we see the outcome tomorrow. But between that, there is a kinetic and dynamic. If kinetic and dynamic are not in place or not perfect and you are not considered in your decision making, you may start the medicine today, but you may not see the outcome tomorrow. So that is the entire meaning of pharmacodynamic and kinetic. Let me quickly explain a few things in dynamic and kinetic. Let us go back to the pharmacokinetic and dynamics, what I was discussing. So the kinetics is, even though in clinical trials, the kinetics have been studied, but when you are giving medicine to the patient, the kinetics is not going to be the same. Patient is not going to take the medicine empty stomach until you tell the patient. So therefore, the pharmacokinetics would be altered. When the pharmacokinetics all set, the concentration of the drug at the site of infection is going to be altered. So you are not going to get the same outcome. So therefore, in the next three slides, what I have done is I'm just showing you, not this one, three important pharmacokinetic parameters that you have to consider when you are prescribing antibiotics. So the first one, as you can see, is the bioavailability because the bioavailability is important when you are prescribing oral dosage form, right? Once the patient swallows the antibiotic capsule or antibiotic tablet, we don't know where it goes and how much of it goes to the site of action. So the bioavailability actually determines the amount and the rate at which the active component of the antibiotic reaches the systemic circulation.
So on the left side, as you can see that I have given the antibiotic, which has excellent bioavailability. In fact, amoxicillin, they say its bioavailability is almost equal to intravenous amoxicillin. And with the presence of food also, amoxicillin is well absorbed. So on the left side, what you can see, the antibiotic, which have an excellent bioavailability when you give by mouth. On the right side, what you can see is the factor which might reduce the bioavailability of other antibiotics, say cloxacillin. Nowadays, probably you are not using cloxacillin or phenoxymethylpenicillin. In the presence of stomach, the absorption of cloxacillin or it's the uh, phenoxymethylpenicillin is quite low. So that is advice which is given to patient to take it. 20 minutes before food. And also the interaction with other drugs in the stomach also will reduce bioavailability. So that's the first thing. The second thing that we want to tell you about this distribution, because the infections are in the focus, unless if it is a septicemia where the entire blood is infected with bacteria, most of the time they are in a focus, they are in a tissue. So the best example is the meningitis. So the meningitis, even if you give the most appropriate antibiotic in the most appropriate doses, that if the CSF penetration is limited, that antibiotic is not going to reach the site at the appropriate concentration. So therefore, if you are selecting an antibiotic for meningitis, try to select a very lipid-soluble antibiotic, for example, vancomycin. Most of you know vancomycin is used in the meningitis but please remember vancomycin has a very limited CSF penetration if there is no inflammation. So if there is a this established meningitis, vancomycin will penetrate. But if the infection is being cured, latter part of the meningitis, or if you have given steroids, sometimes you give steroids as an adjuvant in the treatment of meningitis before starting an antibiotic, they will reduce the inflammation and penetration of vancomycin is going to be limited. So these are the information that you need to have when you are actually prescribing an antibacterial agent. So this particular chart gives you antibiotic which have excellent penetration into the CSF an antibiotic with poor penetration to the CSF. So everyone wonder beta lactam is a poor penetration, but crystalline, sorry, benzyl penicillin is used in the treatment of meningitis. But if you read at the bottom, what I want to say is we compensate that by giving a very high dose of uh, benzyl penicillin because it has a wide therapeutic index. So even if we give a very high dose of benzyl penicillin, it will not reach the toxic level. But if 5% of that penetrate the CSF, then the adequate amount would be there in the meninges for the treatment. Again, gentamicin, as you know, it is not used in the treatment of adult meningitis, but it is used in the treatment of neonatal meningitis because the blood-brain barrier is not formed in the neonate. The other thing about is the pharmacokinetic parameter is the volume of distribution. Again, a neglected area, but you have to understand the dose you put into the body of a patient converted to concentration in the plasma or the site of action, dose divided by volume of distribution. So if your volume of distribution has expanded due to some iatrogenic factors like cardiac failure, volume overload or dengue leak, the dose is the same, volume of distribution has increased, so the concentration is going to be low in the plasma as well as the site of action. But we never consider these things and we don't measure the blood levels as you know in Sri Lanka. So therefore we may be giving the same dose, but it is not going at the same concentration at the site of action. Then the plasma elimination half-life. These are the I think, four pharmacokinetic factors I am trying to tell you. One is the bioavailability, second one is the penetration, third one is the volume of distribution, fourth one is the plasma elimination half-life. So when you look at the plasma elimination half-life, that is a time taken for the concentration of a medicine to come into the half. Why it becomes important in antibacterial agencies, if it has a long elimination half-life, it takes about five elimination half-life for the drug to reach the steady state concentration. So therefore, for antibiotic which has a um, Long plasma elimination half-life, generally we recommend that loading dose to be given before we continue the antibacterial treatment. So that is the important point of that. 
Then when it comes to pharmacodynamics, so kinetics is taking the drug to the site of action, dynamics to initiate the action at the site of action. So the initiating the site uh, action on the site of infection is mainly based on the mode of action of the antibiotic, lack of resistance, so the bacteria quietly die because of the antibiotic, which is now rare, and bactericidality of the antibiotic. Nowadays, we don't promote the term bactericidal antibiotic and bacteriostatic antibiotic because sometimes a bacteriostatic antibiotic in high concentration can be bactericidal. So we say bactericidality. So therefore, if it is bactericidality, it might ensure the miracle of the antibacterial. And the next two slides, I don't know, most of the trainees who are study preparing for MD exam would know these, or others might have forgotten, that there are three parameters in pharmacodynamic of antibiotic. One is the Cmax, that is the concentration which is reached at the highest point, you can see that. Then you can see Tmax, so that the Tmax, as you can see, is actually the time interval, the concentration of the antibiotic is there in the blood before the next dose. And the area under the curve is actually the total concentration of the antibiotic to which the bacteria is exposed. So these are three important pharmacodynamic parameters, Tmax, Cmax, not Tmax, actually T, Cmax and AUC. Based on that, antibiotics are classified into, as you know, three mainly. Um, uh, no, I this one I will come to that again. Sorry. So because I started this, I will tell you. So what are those three group of antibiotics are concentration dependent antibiotic, time dependent antibiotic, as well as the antibiotic, which has a long post antibiotic effect. If you I hope that I had a graph. I don't know. I will put the no, the graph is not there. So um, you'll speak with this graph, right? Can you look at this graph if you are listening and not on the opposite side of the screen? So the concentration dependent antibiotic are actually depend on how high is the concentration of the antibiotic at the site of action to kill the bacteria. So the proportion of killing effect is proportionate to the concentration. So that's a concentration dependent antibiotic. What do you mean by time dependent antibiotic is it's not the high concentration which is necessary to kill the bacteria effectively. It is the time duration during which the bacteria is exposed to a little higher level of antibiotic is the factor which determine the bacterial killing ability in type dependent antibiotic. So if I repeat concentration dependent, you want a very high concentration for the drug to work very well. Time dependent antibiotic that you want the drug to remain in the circulation and the site of action as long as possible between the two dosing interval for the drug to kill the bacteria effectively. So for concentration dependent killing, you want to give very high doses so that it will reach the highest level. For the time dependent antibiotic, you don't need to give very high doses, but you have to give frequent doses. So the concentration of the drug would be above the minimum inhibitory concentration for most of the time. So that is, a, can you see the MIC line? And if you see them, that is the minimum inhibitory concentration. So and if you can see the time dependent, that means above that, how long it is there, that is time dependent. Then can you see the top one, that is a one shot, that is what aminoglycosides are now given, once a day dose because it's concentration dependent. So as you can see, the higher the concentration, the higher the efficacy of killing. Then the fluoroquinolone, it is also concentration dependent, but it is not the highest point. You need to have a sort of a wide concentration distribution for the fluoroquinolones. So therefore, then you have selected your antibacterial to determine the dose as well as the dosing interval. We don't say frequency of administration for antibiotic. You need to know whether that antibiotic falls under time dependent killing or the concentration dependent killing. Before that, I said something else which I didn't tell you. Um, that currently the concept of loading dose is not limited only to the drugs which have a 
long elimination half life because the current thing is that at the initial period of infection there can be high rate of multiplication of bacteria and also that you could have uh, the resistant strains as well so having a suboptimal concentration at the beginning of the treatment is not going to be very good so the current recommendation if you see sometimes they would say even for antibiotic with short elimination half-life better to give a loading dose so in this picture what i try to actually show you is hit the bacteria very high at the loading dose itself and remember even if you give a high loading dose depending on the volume of distribution the concentration at the site of infection may not be very high so work out whether there is an expanded volume of distribution water soluble antibiotics in cardiac failure renal failure or dengue leak uh, lipid soluble antibiotic for an obese person the volume of distribution would have been higher than what has been predicted. So you may have to give a little higher dose. So this is time-dependent killing. So I explained the time-dependent killing, concentration-dependent killing, I explained. So how can you consider these things? PK, PD, so the action three. So action one is no antibacterial. Action two is careful in selecting antibacterial. Action three is considering the PK, PD in your planning schedule, Allow the antibiotic to penetrate the site of action, remove the barriers, having a dose on a higher side, if necessary, have a loading dose, always leave a formulary and guidelines. And we have, there are clinical pharmacologists that if you really need that, you can consult us in deciding the dose. The next one I wanted to speak about is good administration, storage and disposal practice because this is something which is neglected by doctors. We think that this is not our area, but we allow the antibiotics to be lost because bacteria are developing resistant when we don't show this um, interest. So this is something that it has been documented if you want to know. Disposal of unused antibiotic as household waste it's one of the determinant of development of resistance. So there are recommendations in place how antibiotic had to be disposed, especially the oral one, right? So therefore, in, if you go to the FDA site, they will put you never to be flushed in the zinc or the toilet. So it has to go to uh, with, mixed with something that uh, they will, no one will handle it and disposed in the garbage hole or in uh, liquid preparation for children what we advise is before discarding the liquid preparation pour hot water into the remaining liquid antibiotics so that it will become inactive and even if it reaches the environment bacteria would never get exposed to an active antibiotic to become resistant so therefore what i'm trying to tell you is you had to educate the patient educate the nursing officers in the hospitals about discarding antibiotics safely because we have done a study recently in neonatal units wide variety or wide way of disposing the balanced antibiotics are in place they have to be uniform and it has to be one of the activity of antimicrobial stewardship program because you never know how the balanced antibiotics are disposed in your ward uh, the other reason in children why it, this administration becomes problem is, as you know, we don't have the proper dosage form for children. So most of the time we may have to break and give the antibiotic. Sometimes people open the capsule and give the antibiotic. That means we are actually not allowing the bioavailability or the stability data to happen. So the concentration of the drug reaching at the site of infection is not going to be the same. So because of these economic constraints, we don't have the appropriate dosage form for children. So that also contributes to development of resistance because the suboptimal concentration reaches the site of action. The other thing is as doctors, we never ask the patients how they reconstitute an antibiotic powder that we have demonstrated uh, in one, in I think it is Northern Province, a study where even teachers do not know how to accurately reconstitute an amoxicillin powder and take 5 ml and give to the child. So therefore, the child would be getting a low dose, low concentration. The drug may not be working. 
bacteria would develop resistance. And if they go back to the doctor, they might get another antibiotic. It may be watch category even. It increases the problem. So therefore, this I have told you. So therefore, that uh, this in uh, because of the time limit that I am going, I think I have about four more slides. So because if you put all this good administration practice together, that as doctor that we had to put me mechanism in place, the antibacterials are given appropriately, whether it is oral or intravenous, they are reconstituted appropriately. The accurate volume or the dose is taken. And it is given as much as possible in the way it is supposed to be given, not broken and crushed. But when we break, break and crush and give, we have to understand that we may not be giving the correct concentration. The second point is actually uh, disposing the antibacterial agents that we have to make sure there is a mechanism in place in our hospitals as well as in homes, how they discard the balanced antibiotic. And also we should not give too much of antibiotic for them to take home. And also in the hospital, when you calculate the dose for intravenous antibacterial, calculate in a way that there will not be a lot of balance there. But unfortunately, we don't get small vials because again, small vials are more expensive than the larger vials. So in Sri Lanka, most of the time that we get antibiotic, adult antibiotic vials for the pediatric ward, never allow anyone to flush the balanced antibiotic to the toilet or zinc. So this is the FDA circular about the storage and discard, but probably in Sri Lanka, we are not brought in. So based on that, never stop with just prescribing. Always think what happened to the antibiotic that you have prescribed. Calculate the dose in a way avoiding balance and leftover, get a good team in place because doctors cannot be bothered with storage and disposal, but train your team, prescribe suitable dosage form, have a local policy. The last one is about two slides about the last action that I want to tell you is that don't stop with prescribing the antibiotic, monitor the use of antibiotic. If it's the inward, it is easy to monitor. If it is outpatient, at least have a telephone communication with the patient to see how it's going, about adherence, about the storage, about the administration, about the safety, about the response. Some of the wards have already started a dedicated antibiotic chart so that you are compelled to review the patient every 48 hours. You are compelled to stop the antibiotic maybe after patient response. So if possible, have a dedicated antibiotic prescription chart. If we don't do that, can you see the bacteria has become so powerful and it can even damage the scientists who have developed the antibiotics. So based on the last point, monitoring patient, review regularly, Invite uh, microbiologists, which you always do, but there are clinical pharmacologists in the universities as well in your decision making. Have a dedicated antibiotic prescription chart. Educate the patients, parents, and healthcare team and monitor safety, adherence, response, and investigation. Knowing my platform, I know you will have some questions about what others are doing about this. You will say, we don't get quality assured antibacterial. You would say that we have limited number of accredited generics. We have large number of uh, generic products which we are not sure of. We don't have access group of antibiotic in our hospital. We don't have suitable dosage form and stem. We don't have microbiological support and we are not ready to work with clinical pharmacology. So we want to make a decision. So what I'm trying to tell you is yes, we have all these deficiencies in this country. But as a doctor, my main duty is prescribing and monitoring and looking after the patient. So anything involved with it that we should do our duty because if you want to go somewhere, we may have to start somewhere. Just because someone else is not doing their duty, just because someone else is not looking after the healthcare in this country, that doesn't mean that I also should wait without doing nothing. So something is better than nothing. So that is the reason I accepted to do this presentation on a Sunday, on a busy schedule. I hope this presentation might help one or two of you to be the champions and do your duty towards preserving the miracle of antibacteria. Thank you very much. I had to rush in the last part of the lecture, but I think I have finished it 
two to three minutes longer than the given one hour. Thank you very much, all of you. Thank you. Thank you very much, madam, uh, for your uh, valuable lecture. Uh, it is a really important and a practical lecture, which will, uh, if we don't follow these guidelines, we will uh, have a problem in the future. Madam, uh, we have uh, some questions that were presented uh, before the lecture. Uh, yep. I picked two questions, madam. Uh, how long should, uh, how, how to decide the duration of antibiotic therapy uh, in a patient to prevent the resistance? Yeah, the thing is that earlier days that um, there is a concept, there are earlier days, there was a concept that you need to have a fixed days, right? So um, fixed days mean that 14 days for meningitis, 21 days for endocarditis, 7 days for tonsillitis, 10 days for tonsillitis, 3 days for otitis media. The current concept is actually the duration is uh, not uh, fixed. Right, the duration is based on the patient response as well, as well as the standard formulary recommendation for serious infection. So now recently I was reading, maybe yesterday I was reading for febrile UTI, because generally we used to give seven days, 10 days for febrile UTI. But recently I was reading that for febrile UTI, even five days of antibiotics is adequate. So what I'm trying to tell you is that you need to know the latest evidence. Second thing is you need to know your patient. So there is no fixed duration these days that has changed. Earlier we say the more we use, the more we lose the antibiotic. Now that is also not there. Sometimes with the first dose also the bacteria would develop resistance. So nowadays that slogan is there, not there. That earlier days we used to say, the more we use, the more we lose antibiotic. But nowadays they don't encourage that slogan because they think even with the first dose of antibiotic, the bacteria would develop resistance. So my recommendation is rather than worrying about this duration, not to start antibiotic as a reflex action. Because antibiotics are not antipyretics. Please think, when a child or a patient comes with fever, there is no need to start antibiotic unless your clinical judgment tells you this is a serious in bacterial infection. I should start antibiotic now. If not, the patient is going to go into serious consequences. So the duration that I suggested is go with the formulary and patient response and the latest evidence. Yesterday, there was an evidence coming up to say febrile UTI. You can even have a shorter duration of treatment. Thank you. Right. Any other no, questions? You, There's one more question I have chosen, madam. Uh, how, uh, you know, if you are prescribing an IV antibiotic and if there's poor response, and if you are changing the IV antibiotic, do we need to uh, tail off the previous IV or to prevent the resistance, madam? No, no, not necessary. Uh, just not necessary. Though that what you are trying to ask is that, say, for example, you are on IV kefriaxone and if the IV kefriaxone is not working and if you assume uh, you are given the correct dose, you have given a quality assured antibiotic, your reconstitution is correct, your dosing interval is correct, everything in perfect, but you want to move to maybe vancomycin, there is no need to tail off the keftriaxone. You can stop it unless you think there's an additional spectrum which is not covered by the vancomycin is still covered by the keftriaxone because vancomycin, and my, in my example, vancomycin is mainly gram positive. But if you still don't know whether it is a gram negative or gram positive, and if you still want to have a gram negative cover also, then you can keep your keftriaxone. You don't need to reduce it. You can keep your keftriaxone and add vancomycin. Wait for the reports. And with the report, you can decide. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, madam. Uh, that's the, all. Uh, those are the questions today uh, we got today. Uh, I again you. thank uh, Prof. Shalinishi Ranganathan for her valuable time and conducting this uh, valuable lecture, madam. Thank you very much. And I thank all of you uh, for joining, uh, joining in with us today. Uh, the link for your e-certificate and the CBD points are posted in the chat box. Kindly follow it to obtain your e-certificate. And I invite all of you to join in, uh, with us uh, in the next week also uh, with our continuous free knowledge academy uh, weekly Sunday webinar series. Thank you very much. I hope you have a uh, pleasant Sunday and a happy weekend.